Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits, venture into unknown territory, take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV, cable channel 212, and streaming live on Facebook. Welcome back to On The Record. I'm your host tonight, Jerome Sawyer. Our media roundtable is back. Now that the ceremony and pageantry of the opening of Parliament is behind us, it's time for the new government to get its legislative agenda moving. My guest tonight, our new social media content journalist, Sasha Lightbourne, as well as talk show host with Guardian Radio, Nahaja Black. Ladies, welcome to On The Record. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. Sasha, you know the facility very well, so I'm not going to have a long welcome <laughs> to you. Nahaja, Wow. Welcome. Thanks. Good to have you on. <laughs> Let me take my pleasure back. <laughs> I'm going to take all of it right, as Sasha, because this is my first time with a, a legend. Oh, and, I'm, uh, I'm too young to be a legend. Well, I mean, listen, <laughs> legendary well, in the work that you've done. Thank you very much. And paving the way. And so it's a pleasure you, and Thank honor. you for being here and continue to do the great work you do as well. So let's talk about the elections first out. Um, during a, a previous show, a lot of former cabinet ministers would have spoken about the frustration index of the Bahamian people and that being one of the uh, contributors to their defeat um, on September 16. Has that frustration index gone away, you think, with the new uh, administration? And will this administration have to face into that pretty quickly, if it, all things considered? Yes, the frustration index remains, if that was really properly stated yeah. in the question. But there, I don't see where the Bahamian people have changed their mindset, where we are tired of the either or. You know, we move forward into this uh, next space with a new government. The government that is in is quite aware of the mindset, I think, the feelings of the electorate, uh, that they have an understanding. I would hope that there isn't much time to, like my husband would say, dollar wine, right? You don't have much time for all of that slapping up, you know? We have the people who require work to be done. And so there is frustration. There is frustration, I believe, with even within government that they will encounter, these, these uh, ministers will encounter. Because the reality is, for all of those who've been in it before and those who are coming in, there's a system of governance that takes some working and getting used to. Mm -hmm. And so they will be frustrated, as we will be frustrated, waiting on them to fulfill promises that they've made. I think the key, though, is that the historic, we have to look at the historical nature of both parties. The PLP has regained the power. And the PLP historically has been considered the People's Party. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the opening of Parliament yesterday, you saw that. The People's Party, they, they've always campaigned on being for the people of the people, a part of the people. But the and FNM would have used the People's Time, time slogan. They yep. did Last use election. the People's Time slogan. But, but let's just think about yep. it. Like I said, historically, Pinling always considered himself to be, he didn't really consider himself a politician. Christine, somewhat. And now Brave is now coming in and we'll see how he, you know, functions amongst the people. But just by the number of people that came out yesterday at the opening of Parliament, people expect something. We want Most something. Definitely. We may give them some weeks to get acclimated because you have to consider the percentage of newcomers that are a part of the cabinet and a part of their government in general is, is large, larger than it's been in, in the last few elections. And so I think people want something. And to be honest, I think they want it now. Mm. What are some of the dangers, though, uh, uh, that this administration will face with so many newcomers? We saw, we saw that in the last administration. We saw the missteps. Um, we saw even the infighting that the, these new members, because you know, gone are the days of the politician who sat quietly and allowed the leader to do whatever. You know, you're out behind closed doors, but when you get in the public as a united front, we don't see that anymore. So what, are the, what do you think inherent dangers await 
of the administration, particularly the hierarchy of the party, because you look, mainly the, outside of Chester Cooper, the senior cabinet ministers are all returning ministers. Mm -hmm. You know, so what, 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 you think there are some inherent dangers that they face with such a large majority and so many newcomers? I think they can't run away from it. Here's, uh, and it, I think there's both sides to that argument as well, right? One, this is a large cabinet. It's very large. Very large. The largest. Yes, and, and one way you have to understand there's a power struggle. There will be power plays. Mm -hmm. And what we learned just in watching the former administration, uh, Dr. Minna seems to have always been fighting for his life, fighting for his mm. position of supremacy. And that started even before the election for him. Exactly, <laughs> right? So now with... Uh, Mr. Davis, and one of the mantras or the narrative surrounding uh, Prime Minister Davis is that he is one who listens. He wants the consultative, a consultative sort of approach to leadership. How will that affect his leadership when you have such a large amount of persons at the table? With and a the large charismatic of, personalities such that as he has. Wayne Monroe. Uh, that he has point. around him. Very strong personalities. Obi Wilchcombe, very strong personality, having a legacy uh, positioning in the party. Um, then there are those, of course, who I've won five terms straight, five elections straight, Glennis Hannah Martin. So there will be that level, of that level of challenge. But one thing they say about the Progressive Liberal Party is this, that, that when they have their issues, they have them behind the doors, they deal with them, you never see them in the front. That's what they say. Will that be the way they handle their business in government? And I think for the Bahamian people's sake, we can't afford this sort of drama, get to work. If you're busy working, do you have time to fight? And the mandate of this government should be a singular focus and vision. We may have different jobs, but it all focuses on a singular purpose or vision. Now, if everyone else has their own game, if everyone else is trying to be seen as the next prime minister and playing for politics or political points, then we'll have chaos. But if people are actually working for the Bahamian people, then you will see unity, unity, unison or unity in work and effort. And I Sasha, think that, go ahead. Sasha, I think one of the, one of the things that it seemed that uh, the former prime minister um, never really acknowledged in his term was that the people voted out the PLP mm -hmm. in 2017 and voted in the FNM. The same argument can be made this time around. And I as think that's well. how we vote. We vote out. We, we never vote, vote in. How, though, do you, again, avoid thinking the election is about you when it really was about getting rid of the other guy? I think that there has to be some real introspection uh, from the FNM at this point. It has to uh, come down to its leadership. Um, and anytime you have someone in power, or, or, or it's my belief that if, if you are leading something and that what you are leading doesn't manifest into what you expect, I, I personally feel like Minister should have stepped down. We should have, we should have a by-election in Killarney. That's just, my, that's just my take on it. So you just were advocating the, he stepped down as leader and resign his seat? Yes. It should have happened. I mean, as the lead, going into, I mean, we've seen it before. I mean, we haven't seen a leader lost their seat, but we saw a minute, uh, we, uh, have, we, well, yeah. we saw a Prime Minister Ing we saw Christine lose, obviously, but yeah. he lost his seat mm -hmm. as well. We've seen Prime Minister Ingram resign as leader of the FNM as well. He didn't necessarily lose his seat. But at the end of the day, I mean, it, 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 the margin of victory that the PLP won by, just like his margin, of, Dr. Minister's margin of victory back in 2017, I mean, Christie did the honorable thing. And I think at the end of the, the day, I think it's time for them to retool. I think the Dr. Minish should, however, still be a part of where did we go wrong, how do we fix, fix this, and how do we gain the people's trust? Because that's what you campaign on, trust. Mm. So I, I think they now have to go to the table, and, and Dr. Minish has to be open about what happened. And I think a lot of it should be attributed, unfortunately, to his leadership. Bahamian pe the Bahamian people were, and they were very clear. Mind you, there's still a theory that a lot of people didn't vote. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reasons those are, a lot of people didn't come to the polls. But did they not come to the polls because of COVID? Did they not come to the polls because they felt disenfranchised? Did they not come to the polls because they, they're just done with politics in general? So that brings me to another question. With voter turnout at only at about 65%, uh, the PLP would have won but that's not a, a decisive majority. Mm -hmm. So even though they have won and they are in charge, 
you must always have in your side view that there is a significant, there are a significant amount of people who did not vote you in. How do you, how do you, I guess, keep them happy, or how do you really uh, incorporate them into into governance now? When, let's be honest, they did not vote for you for whatever reason. This is the uh, the buying in strategy. Mm -hmm. The Progressive Liberal Party now has to govern if they're interested. And I always wonder if parties are actually interested in winning again. It seems as if many don't seem to care about trying to win another term, right? Because this is politics as far as I've learned and your viewpoint on it is that you are like a sower, right? A farmer. You're sowing seeds that reap a harvest in a later time. You do things strategically so that when we get to the next period that we can say in this final year even we're reaping a harvest for you to have recency bias and you can see where we're going with this movement. The fact that the, the Progressive Liberal Party, I hope that they're awake. And awake meaning that they've noticed that we did not win by a landslide because we did, in essence, in terms of seats. Mm -hmm. In terms of our constituencies, yes, we did do that. But at 67% of the vote, we know our base came back. The seniors who had decided they were anti the former administration went back and decided to vote. There was voter apathy, we're almost certain, but then there was the COVID fair, all of these things. If you and have, the protest vote. And, and the protest. Oh, the, not to vote, sorry. Exactly. The protest, yeah. So if you have that, then you understand that I can do better and I must do better because I won't be a perfect government. That mindset with humility, honor, and integrity gives you the tools because that mindset, it shifts your mind. It shifts you into saying, we don't have time for insider fighting. We have to do things correctly. And so if that's the mindset where you say, we we need to now get 15% more. We need to get more people at the polls because we're not going to be perfect government. Will we upset the FNMs and get them back in line? Will Dr. Minnis leave and give us some new energy in the party? Will there be a new leader that can revitalize and bring hope? We are afraid of hope coming from the FNM. So therefore, if you're afraid of hope, now your goal is whilst we're doing A, B, and C, subsequently we're still playing politics. Now I need to get 15% more. I need to get 15% of those non-voters. That is strategic. That is why good governance can get you a second term. But the reality of government is that you are going to have to make some difficult, hard, and painful decisions. Mm -hmm. And when you have inherited a country um, where, whose economy is on life support, uh, that is still very much in a COVID crisis, healthcare teetering, social services are uh, really stretched uh, and the demand is so great. And then on the other side, you have a lot of promises that you have reiterated that, you're going, you, that you are going to fill. Um, the realities of government aren't always pleasant. No, and that's why, you know, there's a saying, Sasha and, and Jerome, that I say, um, not that I say, it's a parable that I, I heard. It says, tell me and I'll forget. Show me, I'll remember. Involve me and I'll understand. The goal is, if you're going to make hard choices that are going to affect the family, affect your business, change a culture, these are things that restructure, retool to provide or produce growth, then you can't just tell me we're going to increase VAT. No, or decrease it. You have to explain how is this to work for the ultimate goal. If we set actual... Bahamians have been disrespected. We were disrespected by the Perry Christie administration when we were insulted with all of these scandals and told not what you're watching. Then worse, we thought you couldn't get worse than that former administration. Then we got the Hubert, Hubert Minnis administration. And I've said many times, the brother went, the PLP dug a basement, created a basement. The brother went with the former administration and dug a hole in the basement. You thought you couldn't go lower. That's where we've ended up. This, if we stop disrespecting the intelligence of the Bahamian people and start to incorporate and involve us in the strategy, you can't just tell us, okay, we're going to increase the amount of money with seniors. You've got to tell us how. We, we, we've, we've got to take a break, but I do want to pick up on this point, really, um, because I think, to your point, you were quite right. There were so many things that were attempted or implemented under the former administration without understanding, without mm -hmm. explanation. And I think that's where they really started to run into a lot of problems. But stay with us. When we come back, we're going to continue our discussion. This is the hottest ticket in town tonight. On the Record is back. Right after this.
Every new season of On The Record, we push the limits, venture into unknown territory, take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV, cable channel 212, and streaming live on Facebook. Welcome back. You're watching On The Record tonight. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We continue, we are continuing. These ladies are in here, they have me all flustered. We are continuing with our media round table. My guest tonight, Sasha Lightborn from Our News and Nahaja Black of Guardian Radio. Ladies, has the PLP oversold, uh, or the PLP government now, the Davis administration, have they oversold on some things. And yeah. let's go over the key issues. Okay. Where, Sasha, I'm going to start with you. We're talking about decreasing VAT. They promised to build two new hospitals, uh, raise minimum wage. Cannabis. Uh, yeah. Introduce cannabis, which interestingly, people didn't clap a lot yeah. for. Yeah. Oh, yes. did, yeah. I thought that, no, I I found that, I thought that was amusing more yeah, than anything didn't. else. <laughs> uh, and some other big yeah, raising ticket minimum items, wage. items that will cost some things. Mm -hmm. Are they overpromised, do you think? Here's how I'm gonna answer that question. Every speech from the throne always sounds good. Every single sure one that I've heard in my short journalistic life has sounded I'm so I'm gonna challenge good. you on that. It's not been short, but go ahead. <laughs> and so I think all speeches have overpromised. I can't remember any speech where there has been even 70% delivery. Mm. So, I mean, if you look at it, it, it a lot of big promises. The VAT promise, I am so interested to see whether that will happen. I see that we have Senator Halkidis, who would have been very instrumental in implementing VAT now as the Minister of Economic Affairs. I'm sure that's going to be something that falls within his portfolio. I'm very interested to find out how they plan to do that, just because he knows of the logistics with respect to implementation and how that happened. So to say that they oversold, overpromised, I, I would say yes. There are gargantuan promises in, in the 11 pages that the Governor General would have read from the hospitals. Where's the money going to come from if you're decreasing VAT? Uh, minimum wage to increase, where, where's the money going to come from? We're still heavily into this pandemic. We are still battling uh, you know, with Tori, and I had the opportunity to see Sweeting ski in Grand Bahama myself, and not even I'd never been there post Dorian, I pre Dorian, I'd never been there obviously in the aftermath. I went earlier this year, and I, I mean, it, it tugged at my emotions. And so, there's still so much that has to be done right away almost dealing with this pa pandemic, and getting vaccines, and even taking care of those people in Abaco and Grand Bahama that are still reeling. How? how? How will you do it? But they say it's a new day, and I think that we should give them an opportunity to at least try. Five. Now, after that opportunity, then we, we grade them accordingly. Five years is not a lot of time uh, to fix some of the major problems that we have. And let's be honest, the last year spent campaigning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, but from where you sit, how quickly do they need to deliver on some of these things in order to keep the voting populace, keep their support base, and even those swing voters happy? Um, we are three weeks into this new administration. What they need to do now is that all of the pomp and pageantry is over and done with. Um, we are, I am tired of tours and uh, the media being called to view you viewing One buildings. just today. That just, that existed before. So you, when you were the Minister of Health, the hospital was bad before. So I am all for, and I, I and, and I'm with you on this, Sasha, we will give them time. But what time must also be is focused, right? So we don't have time to wait for you to focus. You said that you were ready day one. one. Mm -hmm. So we are on day 21. We're gonna let you have this weekend, but now day one, 
of Monday, which is a holiday, so they're lucky. Mm -hmm. Good break. Tuesday, then, of the following week, mm -hmm. we want to hear from the economics, uh, the uh, Minister of Economic Affairs. We want to hear from the Minister of Investments mm -hmm. and the Minister of Finance, because the number one issue is the economy. You cannot talk about, and, and we don't want to just hear you talk about what it is. We want to know now, how do we move past this? What mm -hmm. is the forecast for the economy within mm -hmm. the next fiscal year? You have a budget cycle that you've already passed. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is no more of what can be. We want to know what will be. What I think is going to be interesting, though, is because our, our past two elections have been May, the incoming government has been right at the point of yes. the new budget. And they can And they've it. always said, yeah. oh, this is not our budget. This is a budget exactly. we have in place. Right. But there is still time mm -hmm. now to retool mm -hmm. um, the incoming budget. So it'll be very interesting from where we sit to see what things this government will bring that will be new mm -hmm. um, and that will change. Some predict there will be supplemental, uh, maybe a supplemental budget in there. And that's a great point. And I think that the government should use that to their advantage when it even comes to VAT reduction. Mm -hmm. You can always say, hey, listen, we can't implement VAT reduction at this point. We have a few more months left on, but how many months? I think we have about six to eight months left. Mm -hmm. You can use this time to not provide that promise of VAT reduction because you will have to wait until the next budget. Don't even worry about this, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I remember, I remember, I remember having the opportunity to ask Prime Minister Davis, you know, when, when are we going to see this fat reduction mm -hmm. in particular, which they campaigned so heavily on. And he said, and I quote, when the dust that settles. settles. Which I thought was interesting. And I remember that quote. Good answer. He, he it's said a good that answer. Good answer. those no words exactly. Good so answer. he was yes. not concrete. And like yes. I said, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about perception right. and, and what the public see. And so it'll be interesting to see. I exactly when that dust To me, set. this also Brilliant raises a, a very good point. I think the FNM administration did a very poor job in managing the message. Mm -hmm. It always seemed to me that they were running to catch up with things. Um, I, I remember the, the VAT increase took us almost by, I mean, took everyone by surprise. Even their own members said, we didn't know this was coming. Right. And so it was all of this fallout mm -hmm. um, that happened. And, you know, they, but they, that they, implementation yeah. almost happened the same sort of way, you know. Well, the implementation took time over months, but the announcement that we were even going to have this tax under the Christie administration almost happened the exact same now, way. But then remember now, remember now, Sasha, that the, the Christie administration um, introduced it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Minnes, who was in opposition at the time, well, I, heavily criticized yes, he it. Yes, he did. He did, and, and then and came so back and increased no, it. And then you came no back and was increased coming. it. Yes. So, you know, it, it, it threw it apples to oranges, yes, as yes. far as I'm concerned, when we're looking at that. But again, I thought that there were many crises that the FNM faced into, or had to face, that they just could not get in front of. And, and the thing is, they knew these things were happening. And, but then they did them, most of them to themselves, yeah, right? Like was, we, we can go back into history. How, how do you come into uh, your time, your, your tenure, where you start by saying, after a few weeks off and not getting to work, but you start by saying that the cupboards are bare. But then one of your first announcements mm. in the House is that we need to get a raise as members of Parliament. Um, how do you start off that Ooh, way? Yeah. Uh, so you put yourself in the firing line. You put yourself to criticism and saying, but when is it the people's time? And then the mantra is, who are the people? Because we started to see folks getting honors who we don't see uh, in the community. Mm. We started seeing folks managing the affairs of, 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 of the poor people in feeding who many would say doesn't understand the plight of the middle class, working class, or poor. So what I'm saying is that you, you, they lost us because they were shooting themselves. They were losing themselves in the I, wilderness I, I they created. I agree to you. I, I agree with that. I, because, and remember now, uh, within, I would say, even the first year, the PLB really was not an effective opposition. No. They, they I mean, it, it just well, seemed like they were. only four of them. Only four of them at that they point. Were, they and we didn't want to hear from them either. Exactly. Yeah. So there were, there were still the, sort of the stigma of corruption. Mm -hmm. um, and people were like, you know, anyone but you. Mm -hmm. But I think there were so many missteps by the FNM that it certainly it opened that door so wide I mean, my for them to walk through. There I'm just no wondering, doors, no though, and I'm going to be devil's advocate here, are we giving them a fair shake? Because COVID... We, no other prime minister. And no other prime minister had to deal with Dory. Right. No. So are we truly giving them a fair share? And I'm not. I'm not. I'm not even trying to baby but this crisis. I, I wouldn't. But I think they tr They tried.
they did make some misstep because after we had started to deal with COVID and then the communication started to, it started really well where we were having those mm -hmm. press conferences every, like we were sick and of then, it. Then it's, it's and then it just. The former prime minister then fell out with the media. Right. And then mm -hmm. it just got. It, 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 it seemingly went But I mean, the fact that he had to time. deal with these two, these twin towers, COVID and Dorian. I, I'm just wondering if people are giving him a fair You know shake. what? Can I respond to that sure. just real quickly? One of the things, and I would agree with you, I think most Bahamians during that time were with... When Dorian happened, we were all at attention. I we think were, people were, we with, were with him. I think people were with him. And we were with him when COVID I, I, happened, I, too. I, I agree with so you on that. So yes. when we, we complied, when it was lockdown time, everybody locked. Okay, yeah. shut it down. We were mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. It isn't that we gave him a pass. Leadership, I say, is revealed in crisis, right? right? Yeah, Your yeah, style of leadership that. is revealed in the hard times when pressure leads. Where we began to lose, where he began to lose us... I think as the Bahamian people was that, for me, example, I remember watching in Wuhan from December, going into January, watching this thing called the pandemic. We're learning, we're learning. We watched the first case in the United States in February. I'm asking questions like, what is our economic plan? We are going, we're watching other places locked down. This is inevitable. We know that it's going to come to us. We're an island nation. It has to fly in. It is inevitable. What is the economic plan? We never had one. I remember the Dr. Dwayne Even if we saying, did, it wasn't articulated to the people. I, I don't, uh, uh, go ahead, we're, sorry. We're, but, we're out of time, and, and this is, I, I think, how we can wrap this up. I think for the former administration's best efforts, I what I kept seeing was a lack of information flowing to the people properly. And, and strategy. And strategy. We just were left in the dark in so many instances and on yep. so many issues. And there were so many things going on and seemingly, I can tell you, minister after minister would sit here and I go, well, why is this the first time I'm hearing about this? Or why don't people know about it? Or why, you know, why are you saying, not that it was my job to tell it, but it just seemed that there were so many things happening in silos. Yeah. And then, yeah. I'll leave it here and we're going to go to the break. There was the infighting that started very yes. early mm -hmm. as well. And that really <laughs> crescendoed, you know, even halfway through the administration. Ladies, unfortunately, we're out of time. You know, whenever I bring media folks on, I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk forever. <laughs> Sasha, thank you for coming on. Continue no to do problem. the great work. No you know, I, I, I hit Sasha hard at the beginning, but I really have to thank you for the great work that you do Sasha, for our amazing. news, uh, for our news digital or online, our Facebook page, and all of our social media. Uh, we, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Continue to do the great work. Talk about you ain't been in media that long. <laughs> Ooh, whatever. I'm still a cop. I'm no, still, I, no, I don't feel like a cop, though. I don't feel like a cop. I don't know about that cop thing. Oh, no, man. No, you no, I said, thank you, too. Thank, thank you for doing you. the great job that, that you've done. You certainly rose to popularity. Man, listen. Uh, and, and you're I'm on your We're set. out of time, my producer, Rao and me. When we come back, we're going to continue to dissect the many issues facing this new government. You're watching on the record. Don't go anywhere. Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits, venture into unknown territory, take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV, cable channel 212, and streaming live on Facebook. Welcome back to On the Record. Tonight we're continuing our conversation with the Media Roundtable. On September 16th, the Progressive Liberal Party was handed symbolically the reins of power. And that job has come with some enormous challenges. My guest for this segment, veteran journalist with the Tribune newspaper, Tanya Smith Cartwright, and news director with Eyewitness News, Janaya Noel. Ladies, welcome back to On the Record. 
Uh, I have to say, it's good to see everyone again. It's good Great to be to you, back in studio. It, to see it says you. that we're making progress. You know, yeah. we're able to have these kinds of face-to-face -face discussions again. Let's mm -hmm. first of all talk about, for this segment, really the enormous challenges that uh, are facing this government. They've come in with the COVID, COVID crisis, continuing economic crisis mm -hmm. in many ways. Add to that things like the Haitian immigration crisis now that mm -hmm. seems to be coming to the forefront. Um, throw this to both of you. What do you think the next 90 days will yield for this government? Mm -hmm. Either of you. Well, the government seems to be moving very quickly with things. Seems like they came in with some sort, some level of a plan to deal with stuff. Now, the Haitian thing, I think that kind of blindsided everybody. But again, they seem to be moving rather quickly. The DPM, the Minister of Health, went down to Inagua, met with them, had an interpreter, stated what the thing was going to be, and then I now see them being repatriated. Now, I'm hearing that some other outside forces are having an issue with repatriation. Well, then they should send the money <laughs> to send deal the with these people. As simple as that. We, gotta, we can't afford to feed ourselves and whatnot here. So I don't blame them. Send them back. It's unfortunate, but you've got to do what you got to do. Jenea, you, the, 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 the challenges. Mm -hmm. I think when we look at um, the first 90 days coming out of the gate from a snap election, dealing, as you said, with this COVID crisis, government has been making small but effective changes, in my view. One of the first things that they did was remove the curfew uh, fr from the 9 o'clock hour to the 11.59 hour. Uh, and that is something that residents, Bahamians everywhere have been advocating for because in order for us to fix this whole challenge, we have to address what is happening mm -hmm. in the economy. Mm -hmm. There have been so many people who have been out of work, so many people who have had hours cut off, so many mm -hmm. people who weren't able to do the things, not just talking about things that they would have enjoyed, but mm -hmm. employment was on the line, mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. was on the line, being mm -hmm. able to feed your family was on the line, and all that hinged upon how the economy was performing. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to neglect the fact that we are still dealing with the health crisis. We are continuing right. to deal with this enormous issue of mm -hmm. where do we go from here? And every time we, we set a goal uh, marker, we seem to move away, away from that, because mm -hmm. although persons are seemingly getting vaccinated, mm -hmm. we are seeing more deaths. We're right. seeing, and, and the hospitalization seem to be mm -hmm. al always in limbo. There are mm -hmm. peaks and there are lows. Sometimes you hear, you know, the hospital and the healthcare system mm -hmm. is on the brink. And then you hear, okay, we're getting a little bit of relief. And so I mm -hmm. think it'll be a, a toss up as we continue to maneuver this mm -hmm. COVID situation, something that we have to be pre prepared for. And I think one of the things that we have to do first, and like we heard from the speech from the throne yesterday, we have to be able to fix what is happening in health. And whether that means resources, whether that mm -hmm. means the hospital, I think the first uh, thing or, or that priority list should be health care. I, I want to, to bring something to the fore, though. Uh, it's a sense almost. I mean, one of the, the, the very first act that the new prime minister did was to extend mm -hmm. the curfew mm -hmm. and stop police from stopping you, yes. you know, uh, randomly mm -hmm. for being out after curfew, which tells me there really is no curfew if you look yeah, at it that look way. At it, right. But do you get a sense that... Um, we have let our guards down again we have, when it comes we to have COVID. As a people. We have it, as a people. It, it, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, everybody wants to celebrate a success. Sure. But I thought that the swearing in and the uh, opening yesterday was a little risky for me with that amount of people. Now, bear in mind, everybody was masked up. I saw, you know, that. But those kind of crowds are risky. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's very risky. In terms of your um, no curfew or whatever, <laughs> right? Yeah, I do miss the police. Not, <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm out at those hours, but I do miss the, the police, you know, stopping and, and doing a check. And we need to really put, uh, make a, a full stop. Are we on curfew or are we not on curfew? But it's good for business. I think the argument about curfew goes back to election cycle. Because mm -hmm. on one hand, you have a government of the day telling you you have to follow these uh, safety measures, you have to mm -hmm. abide by these safety protocols, but the masses of people were being taken to islands where we are now seeing outbreaks. Right. We're seeing the result of what mm -hmm. happened with mm -hmm. election campaigning, and it mm -hmm. seems to be two voices mm -hmm. speaking. What are we? Are we in a pandemic? Is the pandemic for some, or mm -hmm. is the pandemic for everyone? And who is out of the pandemic? And so when we have this discussion about the curfew, that needs to be demonstrated from the top. It can't think, be we're having this celebration and then you expect us as a people to follow. So all, all, there were almost two messages, I think, yeah. in some instances. If mm -hmm. you were involved with a campaign, 
Mm -hmm. Sort of do as you like, but for the rest of but us, that, that, to that was I rest that on the laps of the former government mm -hmm. because they were tight. They have a one man in charge of the whole country. We can't mm -hmm. come outside to go and pump water before being cited by the police yes. across the street. But then he calls a snap election in the heights of a pandemic, of a pandemic in the height of a pandemic, and then is a free fall with the campaigning. Or we have on masks and we practice in social distancing. How do you do that with a bunch of people campaigning and trying to win government? And we're in groups of five and everyone is vaccinated. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah sure. Turn <laughs> sure. into 20, 25. Mm -hmm. All right, so we now are in the, I don't know if you call it a honeymoon phase, because I, I think this government is not even being allowed a honeymoon phase. They can't, they, have, they can't have a honeymoon, have honeymoon phase. And they, no. they recognize that and mm -hmm. said that. Uh, <clears throat> But what you have, I think, in the early stages of any administration, there's always a lot of fervor with the press. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions, mm -hmm. a lot of swearing in. People are in office mm -hmm. for the first time. So there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And so there's almost that love affair mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that happens <laughs> then, in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning. So and then, my question <laughs> now is how long or, or what? And let's use the minister administration as, as a barometer. <laughs> <laughs> the form when when Hubert Minnis was in opposition the last time there was a, you know chatty, a, 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 a very chatty <laughs> and it started again. Uh -huh, um, yes, you noticed all access. Uh, you know it was a love affair with the press, mm -hmm. but immediately something happened mm -hmm. almost. Well, the Orban deal happened, Jerome. <laughs> After the Orban deal, I think we can all agree that things went very much downhill. Right. I think so, it was but before not, then. Not, I, even before then, if you ask yeah, me, it because was I thought that, then, he was, he, that there was an adversarial relationship it, that started early. It came in early. with the, yes. the minute the the Ingram the uh, administrate the admit. What was it? Ingram era is over. Yeah. Yeah. Is over. Yeah. That yeah. started it. Totally dismissed the a former that, prime minister. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Isn't that awful? But how does the PLP administration, or what do they need to do uh, to avoid that kind of thing from happening with the Guess media? Guess what, Jerome? They have a lesson. Four yes. years of watching a lesson. Four years of watching cabinet ministers refuse to answer any questions from the press unless you ran on the steps of cabinet office and, and bum rush them pretty yes. much yes. every week on a Tuesday. Refused to answer their phones, refused to answer questions, became combative with the media. And it started with the leader. It if did. your leader is it showing did. you that, then you follow suit, right? The, the minister was actually, act, prime minister, former prime minister minister, was acting like he was angry with the press for whatever reason, you know. But every day can't be reports in your favor. That's not our job. It's, no, it's, it's not, not our job. And then you become very dismissive of, of the press. Mm -hmm. You you don't want to acknowledge them and the vital role that they happen to play in your success. Because right. then you can tell a reporter, okay, bye bye, I gotta go to the gym. Five, four, three, two, mm -hmm. one, A, B, C, or D, and not give a clear direct I'm answer. I'm gonna get some boiled fish. And, yeah. and, and it so seems to be so, so, so yeah. jokingly, like like you you take this as a game. Yeah. And that is what we walked away with. Man, we asking you serious questions, and mm -hmm. this, and you're is, this is your response. Us. We're dismissing us. This is our job, and and you can respectfully say, you know, I don't have the answer at this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. We're still looking into the matter. There are ways you you do things uh, uh, to to avoid this type of combative situation yes. all the time with the press. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that I've asked, um, and I, I I continue to ask folks, is that, and it's really based on history. Um, during the campaign, there are a lot of big promises. Mm -hmm. And it seems time and time again, we overpromise and underdeliver to the mm -hmm. Bahamian people. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, is there a danger of that? Um, uh, and how does the PLP now, how does the PLP and the Davis administration manage the expectations, or can they even manage the expectations? Boy, of the this people? could be a it's rough be one. Rough. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the fat. Yeah. That fat promise is a big one. And, but again, the VAT reduction. The, mm. Yeah, the, the VAT reduction. But again, I say they had four years of a lesson to see all the big promises in two, 2017. A lot of them missed during the last four years, and they see the reaction on those missed promises and what happened in the end. So let, let's look at some of the big ticket items. You've got mm -hmm. the VAT reduction, new you've hospitals. got the new hospitals, mm -hmm. plural, mm -hmm. plural, plural, plural. And plural. Uh -huh. you've got also. Um, an increased promise, increase in minimum wage, mm -hmm. livable wage, yeah, livable wage. 
Also, the increase in, in old age pension. pension. Mm. These are money items. Mm -hmm. And also, the, the promise there and commitment to work with unions. And when we have that union oh, conversation, yeah. that always boils down to money. Whew. So, yes. and lots of it. Yeah, but, and, and, and I want to just hold it on one in particular. Mm -hmm. Belinda Wilson, the president of the BUT, oh, has she said she play. is not working <laughs> with, with, with the state the state the, 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 the state state born. She just said outright. Um, even though, you know, the PLP pro during the election campaign signed this memorandum of understanding and committed to working mm -hmm. with these unions, we all know that, that, that that's a great idea, mm -hmm. but when the rubber meets the road... You have to be able to deliver. And yeah. I think uh, the government of the day now has to take a real realistic view of what they are up against, where we are standing financially, mm -hmm. and whether or not these things can be materialized. And we've heard a lot about these um, PPPs to be able to deliver on, mm -hmm. a, on a lot of these promises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we look at this, and we I spoke about this in another place, when we look at this, we have to be also be able to walk that fine line when we look at concessions, dealing with PPEs to ensure that the best interest of the Bahamian people is mm -hmm. always taken into account. Right now, we have a Alukaya deal that we can't get completed because wow. there, there's a toss up but mm -hmm. about what the concessions are. Mm -hmm. And the former minister talking about, you know, it's been such a vexing situation trying to get this sold. So when mm -hmm. you see a project of that mag magnitude that means so much to the people of Grand Bahama and, and the viability for, for jobs to, to be undertaken, you ask yourself, what would be the best direction to go into? Tanya, mm -hmm. I want to kick this to you before we take this break real quick. Mm -hmm. I found that the minister administration spent a lot of time blaming the PM. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and people very quickly got tired mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I'm sure the PLP is going to put some blame at the feet mm -hmm. uh, of the former administration. Mm -hmm. But looking ahead now, you know, are they in danger of, or, or, or I guess what is, from where you sit, how do you deal with that when you, this isn't what you've created, mm -hmm. but you are now saddled with fixing it? Okay, the first thing, in my opinion, that should be done. To me, the FNM took too long on this blame game thing. Yes. Blame, blame, blame. Months that turned into years. Mm -hmm. After a year, you're still talking about what the PLP did. That's garbage. You should be fixing whatever. <laughs> now, in my opinion, when you first come in office, of course you got to show off these, these, but this is what these dudes were doing. My hands clean, look, this, you know, you show their mess and then you quickly make yourself the stallion that Very fixed good. it, right? But you can't a year and then going into two, two years, years talking even, about you know, what going the, into the election. Four years in the election, yeah. that's you all we heard. What the PLP yeah. did. Exactly. What the Up did. to no, the campaign. But what were you able to achieve? What and that election centered around none exactly. of that. Exactly. I think we agree on that. I think the PLP ran a great campaign in terms mm -hmm. of you know, uh, saying what they were going to do yeah, should they get they into office. I think the FNM wasted way too much time but, talking but about, of the, about P the PLP campaign. The PLP. Hold on, no, I, I can put a pen in that. We got a break. We talk about the campaign after this break. When you get journalists together, we like to talk. Don't go away. Our final segment on the record is right after this. Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits, venture into unknown territory, take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV, cable channel 212, and streaming live on Facebook. And we are back on the record. This is our final segment of the night. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We're continuing our media roundtable. This is the best conversation I've had in weeks, I've got to tell you. The COVID-19 fight has been a long one. From lockdowns, emergency orders, and curfews, COVID-19 has been an emotional roller coaster. 
on a roller coaster that has affected the media in many ways as we experience it day to day. With recent vaccination numbers hitting 100,000 for Bahamians, there seems to be a glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel. Joining us again in this segment, Tanya Smith-Cartwright, veteran journalist with the Tribune newspaper, and Janaya Noel. She is the news director with Eyewitness News. I forgot to tell you congratulations, Thank by you the so way. Much, well deserved. Thank you. All Thank right. You so much. We're very much so. Glad to see when uh, women in the media yes. ascend to, to positions of leadership. Great stuff. Let's talk a little bit about COVID. Uh, 100,000 vaccinations. I think we, 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 we touched on it. This is an ongoing program. Um, this administration, I think, will reap the benefits of what would have happened under the previous administration when it comes to vaccinations. But we see an uptick. I'm always curious, I, I, you guys are on the ground sometimes, but, you know, uh, what do you think has dri is driving people really um, to now get vaccinated in larger numbers? We've been witnessing the death room. I think mm -hmm. everyone has been touched by some way uh, of, of the increase in deaths of COVID-19. Uh, but, but paying due respect to that, people also want freedom. People want mm -hmm. to be able to get out and get back to some sense of normalcy. Uh, people are ready to get back to work. People are ready to just get on with their lives. We've been in this uh, situation for more than 18 months, and I think it, it, it's more than cabin fever at this mm -hmm. point. People are slowly just wanting to do more. And, and I, I also take it back to, to the situations where you see entire families being wiped out. Mm -hmm. You see a mother a brother, a sister, and a dad is the only person left, or, or young children are the only uh, persons left within that unit. Mm -hmm. And so it's something like that would, would, would caution me and say, you know what, I, I have to do something. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to protect myself. Tanya, mm -hmm. how do you think history will record the FNM's handling of COVID-19? Well, that's an interesting subject. Evidently, the populace thinks it was handled poorly. At first, I saw the f and pretty much following world trends. This one is locking down, we're gonna lock down. This one is having emergency orders with a competent authority in charge, I'm gonna follow suit. But all of those countries gradually moved away from those heavy regimes, right? Um, but we stayed. 18 months later, we were still under one man telling us what to do. And that irritated a lot of people. It annoyed people. It seemed heavy-handed and controlling, you know. And I think those things could have been lifted long ago. We could have been in a better position economically, which we started to get back there before they left office, if we're honest. Mm -hmm. But I think it could have been jump-started long before all of this. Let's talk about how this now all translated into the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID-19 was a major campaign issue. Mm -hmm. um, the PLP focused, you know, from where I said, the PLP focused on the way forward, what we can do. Mm -hmm. The FNM seemed to spend a lot of time in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, mm -hmm. they did. They, 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 they rode this whole thing of we have a doctor at the helm mm -hmm. and he's the one who's going to help us to nav navigate out of this crisis. And the pushback to that was we're at this point now. How mm -hmm. have you been so <laughs> successful in bringing us to this point? And, and I think people just became, you know, just, just out of sorts with, 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 with the former prime minister and, and his handling of it. Yeah, and I, I, I thought that firing, because it is what it is, and I think you all know that I like to shoot from the hip. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Dwayne Sands was fired by Hubert Minnis, the prime minister, right? And I think it was really foolish to fire a doctor of those heavy credentials as your health minister during a serious health crisis, and he seemed to be doing well with his ministry up to, to that point. I think it was foolish. Then you bring in an engineer at the helm. And then on the flip side, every day in every TV ad and every speech, I am a medical doctor, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a medical doctor. Do we, it. we know. Now, it it seems to me too it. the campaign was very much focused around Hubert Minnis, yes, the Prime was. Minister, and not, not the, the FNM. FNM. It was well, on the him, PLP seemed to give a they very out. different they branched campaign, out. campaign, right? Not only yes. that, they, the PLP we'll addressed COVID, um, the situation uh, very succinctly by saying, you know, we're not going to do these sort of rallies. We're going, we, for the first time, we saw that virtual rally They went completely mm -hmm. virtual, mm -hmm. right, yeah. which was good mm -hmm. for them. Let's move forward. Um, the FNM has indicated that they're going to have a convention next month huh. uh, to choose a leader. Um, they already have a leadership crisis. Mm -hmm. um, there are FNMs who want Hubert Minnis gone. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he seems to be, you know, um, of the position that if the people want me to stay, I will stay. What people? What people? <laughs> what people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what people? The people where? The, the people that surround him when they go out for lunch? or whatever, people want him gone. He has failed this country, that's why he was voted out. He has failed his party, that's why they want him gone. He needs to go. Identify the, the people for us. Please, I, 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 I am merely, I am merely paraphrasing. Listen, not my words. Listen, Jerome, <laughs> the night of election, I think most of the press expected Hubert Minnis' resignation. And it wasn't there. He didn't even show up to but face argue, his but you supporters. Could, you could also argue that when Perry Christie lost in 2007, he stayed on as leader. Listen, he was trying to count the votes in Seneville to see if it was really <laughs> honest. It's if, a uh, this what it stayed was. on in 90. Two when he lost. Yeah, I think but the I clearest mean, indication, Jerome, is what we witnessed at the polls. One of the yeah. lowest voter, voter turnouts. And if you need any more convincing of, of who people don't want you there, let's look at where the data is. And the thing is that there were more FNMs who stayed at home. They decided not to vote. They don't want to go in the next direction, so they will just abstain. I don't want to vote because I'm not putting my vote to put this man back in office. They succeeded. He was voted out. He said on record, I will not offer myself as leader, right? He said that, right? I, I just want to stay in the reins to, to, to be. I knew that he was fooling them. In this morning's <laughs> paper, it says that he's, he's toying. On, he's toying he's with coming out the box um, um, you know, for, to I've run for leader. I've always said this menace has been credited with being a strategist and all of this, I think, is a part of his, strate his strategy. And I think one of the things that he wants to do, while I'm not going to directly put my name in the race, I'm going to ensure that someone does nominate and me. And then I'm going to say, oh, it ain't me. They really want me. Those are the people. No, those are the people. I've identified the people. I see this to solve the case and identify the people. Janaya, you know what this was? This was in 19, this was in 2005 or 6 when the people called for Hubert we, Alexander Ingram, Ingram yes, to, to come return. back. But we the want difference, we the want difference is yes. they wanted Hubert Ingram back. He was vibrant. He knew what he was doing. Got one more question. He, he want, they wanted him back. We but this is not one. the case with this guy. We they have, want I, him gone. I, we have one more question. Boy, this is a gone. hard show tonight. All right. Um, pro, soon after uh, the FNM would have won in 2017, we saw three former cabinet ministers paraded before the courts and charged. Mm -hmm. Two of those cases um, have been disposed of and they were found not guilty. One still continues, uh, mm -hmm. has not been dealt with yet, has not come to trial. Do you think we may see a repeat of former ministers or people who have served in government being hauled before the court on corruption charges? Wow. I think so. I think, right. I think so. We've had a, a situation right before election dealing with not a, a, a cabinet minister, but someone who hold a, a position on a board, and there was a, a lot of, of inconsistencies with their response to some mm -hmm. of the questions that mm -hmm. were being answered, and this government has already committed to be investigating that case. Now, whether mm -hmm. or not that uh, translate into criminal charges, we'll see, but I think that after government has, has completed all of these reviews that they say that they're doing, I think it's going to be a lot of questions that need answers that might require some criminal uh, exercise to take place. We, we don't know. We, we, we In regards to the, the PLP matter, the cabinet ministers as the FNN, because were they in office a month yet before those dudes? It was a very, it was a very short window. It was a short the, window, short so window. you're dragging them before the court. To me, like you were blood hungry. Oh, they calling for blood, so let's shame these fellas. You need evidence when you're going to carry a cabinet minister to court, charging him with corruption. But to their defense, they have uh, ministers, former ministers of Sahi, the former yes. minister of national security, was here last week and said, it was not me. I did not order this. So who did? Well, it, it was a criminal investigation. Who did? Tell me, Pontius Pilate. <laughs> who is it? I, you know, I, I nearly had a message you, you know. Who yeah. was digging But no, but to my question, and, and I guess if it does happen, are we going to see now, or is this going to signal the, you know, a, a precedence? You know, anytime you're out of office, yeah, it's you almost be like a tip for yeah. time, yeah. 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 Right? yeah, yeah. Do, do you think? But that you know what, Janaya, if you if you will, you know what the the to me the bigger picture is. You're playing this tip for tat game. 
but we are on the international front now. Yes. Everyone is watching. Look at this corrupt country. Every minute they're dragging their leaders yes. mm -hmm. before the court. It doesn't look good. Doesn't the solution look. for that stuff? What about well, investors? And we've got to go. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and you know, the, 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 I think the solution to all of that is mm. all of it is. When you're in office, operate at the highest level operate of integrity. Operate as you should. Mm -hmm. operate, operate as you, as you should. should. So there is no what question at the, the end of the day. What about the enablers, the leaders that allow these things? We, and, we, and they well, you know, by and we often hear If we start push. talking about corruption, we could be here for two hours. Yeah, yeah this is true. <laughs> this is a long show. <laughs> Ladies, thank you. Thank you, I Jerome. enjoy these thank shows so, so much. much. Mm -hmm. uh, continue to do the great work that you do. Um, our work never ends. It doesn't. Um, and anytime there's a new administration, it's a new adventure. Right. I always see it. So continue to do the great work you're doing. Of course, I'll bring you back on again. Thank you. That Thank sounds you. good. Sounds an awesome you. job, like always. Yes, Thank you. Yes, Thank you so much for coming. Y'all see, always making me I used to work here, you know. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. I know it's my first producer. <laughs> My first producer, my, my <laughs> car producer is yelling in my ear, it's time to go. Oh, That's going to do it for this edition of On The Record. As always, special thanks to my guests and to my technical and production staff. We'll see you again next week, same place, same time, right here on The Record.